One of the most powerful strategies for formative assessment is engineering effective discussions, tasks and activities that elicit evidence of learning. So if we look at slide nine, um, it, it begins to outline the really important principles. The big idea here is quite simply that questioning should cause thinking. Do our questions cause thinking or do they provide us with useful information that helps us teach better? And, and there are lots of ideas here but there are a couple of very, very simple principles. Just the idea that questioning should cause thinking or provide useful information to help us adjust our instruction to better meet student needs. I was working with some students the other day, they were in year seven, and I asked them, can you have a, right, uh, can you have a triangle with two right angles? That looks like a really boring closed question because there's two answers, one's right and one's wrong. But for these students, they didn't know. So one boy was trying to build a really long, thin triangle. And I asked him, why are you doing that? He said, my maths teacher said that parallel lines meet at infinity, which I thought was rather ingenious. Um, another boy was trying to solve this by using the angle sum property. So he said, well, I know that the angles have to add up to 180. Um, I've used up 290s already. So the question is, can you have an angle of zero degrees? So the group had an interesting conversation about whether you could have such a thing as an angle of zero degrees. And a girl in the group, uh, she said, um, I think I can do it, provided I can have one corner of the triangle at the North Pole and the other two on the equator. Uh, the boys said that wasn't a proper triangle. But the interesting thing about this whole activity is that it was a valuable activity for them to engage in. Not because it was an open question, it wasn't, it was a very closed question, but it was a question that caused them to think. So questions that cause thinking can be very powerful and they can sometimes look like very closed questions. And sometimes asking closed questions is a good idea. If I'm teaching science and I want to know uh, students' understanding of light, a good question to ask is, which way does light go? Does it go from my eye to what I'm seeing, or from what I'm seeing to my eye? We know it's a good question to ask because a lot of kids think that light goes out from the eye to the object being perceived. So sometimes questions can be really closed and really narrow, but very useful. So the key principles in terms of good questioning are these. First of all, we need to sit down with our colleagues and plan questions. Uh, one teacher said to me, you can't think up good questions on your own because you'll always be victim to your own way of thinking about this stuff. So the starting point is to have some really high quality questions and you get that by sitting down with colleagues to plan questions. Most teachers spend far more time marking and planning what they're going to say to students in their lesson planning than they do thinking of the questions they're going to use. As I said, closed versus open is not terribly important. There are some great closed questions and there are some very bad open questions. What's far more important is whether the question is low order, requiring factual recall or applying an algorithm the students already understand, or whether it's high order that requires them to think. And of course, if you give them a high order question, give them time to think. You don't need to give them time to think if you've asked them a boring closed question. If kids don't know the capital of Sweden, extra time isn't going to help. But if you've asked them a high order question, then give them time to think. And you will all know as well as I do the research that shows that teachers don't wait long enough. Uh, some research has shown that teachers' average wait time is less than one second. One study found 0 0.9. And I know that teachers don't wait long enough, but I actually didn't believe that. So I started looking at teachers' questioning, and I realized that the problem, the reason that the wait time came out so negatively was because teachers ask multiple questions at the same time. They ask a question of a student, and the student doesn't understand, so they be immediately begin to gloss and to try and re reframe the question, and the student still looks a bit confused, so the teacher has a third go explaining this to the question, and the student still is confused, and so the teacher eventually gives up and asks some somebody else. And it's very common to find teacher questions going on for 40 or 50 words, because the teacher hadn't planned the question to begin with. So the important thing about questioning is to plan the question, ask it, and then to be quiet for at least three seconds, provided you've asked a high order question. That's the key idea. Now, there's another principle here that I want to emphasize, and that's to do with the idea of no hands up in classrooms. Now, some teachers have experimented with not letting kids raise their hands, but in most classrooms all over the world, the standard rule is the teacher asks a question, picks on students, who have raised their hands to answer. And I think it's maladaptive. I think it just doesn't work. It's actually lowering student achievement. And I want to explain it by talking about uh, an ice hockey team called the Medicine Hat Tigers. So if you look at slide 10, um, 
The Medicine Hat Tigers are a professional junior league team in, in Canada. Um, they're all you know, young men between the ages of 18 and 20, 20 or so. Um, and each team is allowed up to three 20 year olds, but the total roster of the team is 25 players. And in his book, um, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell presents some statistics on the Medicine Hat Tigers. So he gives the, the height, the weight, whether they're left-handed or right-handed, where they were born, their dates of birth, and what position they play. And he invites the reader to consider what's unusual about this list of data. And very few people get it. Very few people see what's, what's really stunning about this. And the, the most surprising thing about these data is shown in slide 11. It is that out of these 25 players, eight of them were born in January and 14 of them were born in the first three months of the year. So there's something really strange going on here. If you were born in the first three months of the year, you are four times as likely to become a professional ice hockey player as you are if you're born in the last quarter of the year. So what I'd like you to do now is to uh, turn to a neighbor or, or somebody else on your table and see if you can come up with any reasons why you think it might be the case that being born in January, February or March makes you four times as likely to become a professional ice hockey player. Okay, so if you're like most other people, you'll come up with some very ingenious explanations. Uh, one of the most common is that because their birthdays are in the winter, they're more likely to get skates or other kinds of ice hockey equipment for their birthday presents. Um, I've heard some fairly elaborate theories about conception in late spring. The mothers are obviously uh, heavily pregnant in the winter and they're eating more. And maybe that gives rise to bigger, stronger babies. Uh, the answer is more interesting and more mundane. It is that when they start playing in the competitive leagues in Canada, they're based on the age. And so when you start playing, you'll be playing in a team of eight-year-olds based on a starting uh, eight, date of the 1st of January. So that the the kids who are born in January are a bit bigger and a bit stronger than all the other kids. By the time they're nine, because the kids who have been picked for the team have had more training, more coaching and more time on the ice, the difference is bigger. And so they stay on the team. And so each year the gap between those who are playing on these teams and those who are not gets bigger and bigger. And that's why most people who are professional ice hockey players are born in the first part of the year. They weren't that much better. It was just because they were older, but those advantages meant they got extraordinary opportunities. And that's what's wrong with our classrooms. Because when we allow children to raise their hands in classrooms, we are creating different classrooms in our classroom. In one classroom are all the students who are dislocating their shoulders in their eagerness to show you they have an answer. And in the same classroom, you have students who are trying to stay below the radar, trying to avoid being picked on, and that is making the achievement gap worse because the students who are answering every single one of your questions are actually getting smarter. The work of Neil Mercer at the Open University shows that students who engage in those kinds of classroom discussions actually get smarter. Their IQs go up. And the students who are trying to stay below the radar, they are missing out on the chance to get smarter. They are staying below the radar and they are just staying the same. So if you're letting your students volunteer to show you they have an answer, you're actually making the achievement gap worse in your classroom. It's been called the Matthew effect after the passage in the Bible uh, where those that have are given more and those who have nothing, what little they have is taken away. So if we're going to create equitable classrooms, we have to use an approach that I call no hands up except to ask a question. So we might use basketball rather than serial table tennis. So rather than a teacher's always evaluating every single student's answer, the teacher might ask one student a question, you might ask a second student whether the answer is correct or incorrect, and a third to give it an explanation. So the important idea here is that the classroom questioning goes around the classroom and it's done at random. The fundamental rule is no hands up except to ask a question. So any kid can raise their hand to ask a question, but if the teacher has posed a question, then it's up to the teacher to decide how to do it, and it's done at random. Of course, random is difficult. 
uh, teachers think they can do random, uh, our evidence is that they can't. Because they're always drawn to students who are going to give them a good answer when time is tight. So some kind of randomization technology is required. Uh, you could actually get uh, interactive whiteboard software that includes a randomizer. You can make up your own with PowerPoint. There are many things you can download from the internet. Uh, and there's even an app for the iPhone these days that does random questioning. But I prefer children's names on sticks, little sticks of wood, or lollipop sticks or tongue depressors uh, in a cup because it's just so much more flexible. If a student's really annoying you, you can write their name on 10 additional sticks and put it in the cup. So the important thing, it's, it, it's, it's flexible, it can be used in a range of ways, but the important thing is that when you ask a question, the students don't know who's going to answer. And that's an extraordinary shift. I was lecturing a group of 1,000 uh, teacher training students uh, a couple of months ago, and I picked them up at random to ask questions, and I interviewed some of them uh, later. And I said to them, did it make a difference, the fact that I was going to call on some students at random? And they said, yes, it made us pay attention. And I said, even though your chances of getting picked were only one in a thousand, they said, yes, it makes a difference. So the idea of random questioning. Um, now, of course, when you start doing this, when you change the rules on kids in this way, you'll get a lot of resistance. You'll get kids saying, don't know. And the question is how you handle that, because in some classrooms the teacher says, OK, and asks a different kid. Now, the kid, the kid who said don't know is just one. So a smarter response is to say, OK, I'll come back to you. So you ask that kid, listen to the other responses I'm going to get. So you ask other kids around the class, get two or three different answers, and go back to that first kid and say, which of those answers do you like best? The idea is that kid is always on the spot. Even if it's a factual question where there isn't a variety of different answers, you can allow the student to ask the audience and get some help. And then they have to repeat the answer. It doesn't teach them very much, but it does establish the principle that when I ask a question, you will answer it. And a third option, you have to be careful how you use this, but if you know the reason the kid is saying don't know is just because they can't be bothered to think, Ellen Keane suggests that a really good comeback to that is yes, but if you did know, what would you say? The idea is that every student knows that they would be expected to come up with an answer, even if it's wrong. And some question, uh, some teachers use a strategy like saying, OK, well, tell me a wrong answer. Tell me something you know the answer isn't. The important thing is students must expect to be engaged, must expect to contribute. Um, hot seat questioning is a strategy for getting a more thoughtful set of responses from a, to a question. So random questioning can be very useful for engaging students, but it often leads to a very flat classroom dialogue because the questions are popping out all over the place. So an alternative is to pick on a student and ask them a second and a third and a fourth follow-up question. And many people are worried about that because the students on the other side of the class may be off task. Not if they know that the next thing you're going to do is to pick on one of them at random and say, OK, can you summarise what she just said? So the important thing is we always keep the class on their toes by creating a, a kind of expectation that you could be asked to respond to a teacher's question or something a student has said um, at, at a moment's notice. Obviously, give students time to think about this, but the important thing is that everybody's engaged. Now, these techniques are very helpful for creating engagement, but they're not very good te techniques for getting teachers to, um, to be able to make their teaching more responsive by giving them um, information about the whole class's understanding. I mean, when I was teaching regularly full-time, I think the decision I most made most often every single day was, do I need to go uh, over this one more time, or can I move on to the next page? And how did I make that decision? I would make up a question on the spur of the moment. I would ask the class. Uh, half a dozen students would raise their hands. I'd pick on one of them. Uh, he'd give me the right answer, and I would say, good, and move on. I'm making a decision for the whole class on the basis of a response from one or maybe two students. So if we're serious about making our teaching more responsive to student needs, I think every single day we have to make far more use of what I call all student response systems. You can invest in these classroom clickers, these electronic voting systems where students beam their answers in. And people say one of the advantages of them is that they're secret. But we've found teachers using just cards with A, B, C and D written on them. And that's been quite fun, interesting because we found that students like those better than the, uh, the random questioning. I did some interviews with girls in year six and year seven, and I asked a girl, you know, I said, do you prefer the lollipop sticks or do you prefer the cards? And this girl said, I prefer the cards because even if you get it wrong, 
there's always somebody else who gets the same wrong answer as you. So of course the advantage of the electronic voting systems is they allow students to be secretly successful. But the advantage of the ABCD cards is it actually starts making the classroom into a safe place for making mistakes. And uh, you know, we have seen teachers very worried about this. You know, very often to begin with, they make the children choose their cards underneath the desk and they're looking down there. And then they have to put their heads on the desk and hold up, hold up their responses. Um, but within two or three weeks, what we have found is that students aren't cheating, they aren't copying. They are getting their own answers right, uh, they're choosing their own answers, and then they're sharing their answers with the rest of the class and they don't mind being wrong. One teacher's taken this even further. She uses multiple choice questions with four options, A, B, C, D. And if at least three students choose each option, she sends the students to the four corners of her classroom, which she has labeled A, B, C, and D. And so if you think that C is the best answer, you congregate in the C corner with all the other students who think that C is the best answer, and your task is to try to persuade all the other students that C is the best answer. And sometimes you'll see a little boy in the C corner listening to his peers, beginning to suspect that C might not have been such a smart choice after all. And what you see him do is beginning to kind of creep over towards the D corner ever so slowly and surreptitiously. Why is he doing it sneakily? Because he thinks he's cheating. I think he's learning. It's about creating a classroom where kids think that making mistakes is good, it's right, a teacher in Scotland I've worked with has taken this even further. She has a poster up on a wall which just says, stuck, question mark, good. It was worth coming in today. Now, the advantage of these ABCD cards is that they are very quick to use, but they do require preparation. You can't really make up a multiple choice question on the spur of the moment. So if you want a, a quick response, then I think these mini whiteboards, these dry erase boards are very powerful. I think they're the most important development in educational technology since the slate. Uh, there really is nothing new here. The best teachers were doing this with slate and chalk 150 years ago. But it's very powerful because you, know, you, you get students to answer a question and you eyeball the whole class's responses and if everybody gets it right, you move on. If nobody gets it right, you teach it again, but slower and louder. But of course the most likely outcome is that some kids get it right and some kids get it wrong, which means that you've created a teachable moment. The disadvantage of these um, mini whiteboards is that many teachers make the mistake of getting kids to write too many words on there. If there's more than three words per student on this mini whiteboard, then you've got a hundred words to read when you look at the whole class of responses. So if you want a longer response, then I think the, um, the exit passes I mentioned earlier are a good idea. So five minutes before the end of the lesson you give each student a card, they write down an answer to a question like why can't you have a probability greater than one? Why are historians concerned with bias when analyzing sources? Collecting the answers and then use them to decide where you start tomorrow's lesson. Some teachers make the students write their names on the back of these cards and then they use them as placemats for tomorrow's lesson. In other words, they, they create mixed ability groups by making sure that in each group there's at least two students who gave the right answer. So uh, there's a range of techniques here, but the big idea here is that teachers are making much more systematic use of the evidence about children's understanding before they decide whether to move forwards or to go back. It's a very simple idea. It's something that teachers have always done. Teachers have always been responsive to students' needs. What the idea of these strategies is that we actually just slightly improve the quality of the evidence so that we are able to take real hard quality data into account in deciding what to do next. Thank you.